Hey, hey, look at that. We are live. I think we're live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. Oh, yeah. I'm, I am, thank God, in London. Yes, I'm and, calling Require and, in Chicago. In Chicago. And we are back live. Woo live. I know. Live. Crazy. This is not a, this not my is not a tape. I'm in Chicago. My mouth is moving. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour. We're excited to be here. And thanks to Stephen Ambrose Historical are, Tours yeah. for helping bring you the show. Check out their rich offering of military history tours at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, perhaps you're listening on the HHH podcast, we are glad you are here. And today we will be talking about the 1921 yeah. Murder Farm Massacre. So please let us know that you're out there and what you're drinking. Oh my gosh, there's a bunch of people who are there already. And um, uh, Chris, um, what are you drinking, Rick? I, I'm drinking a beer. I have a you know a a nice um, beer in my psyop change persuade influence mug or glass. What are you drinking? And you're frozen, Chris. So we Chris has been having some intermittent oh. Wi-Fi problems today. So there he is. Now he's back. Are you back now? Okay. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, who supports Glenn us. Tour. Okay, I know. very good. Nice. There we go. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, especially our top shelf patrons. Uh, and yes. uh, here you are, and you can join this group. Where's my? Where's the? There it is. You can join the top shelf patrons uh, by clicking on Patreon.com/slash History Happy Hour. Hey, Chris, I thought that we should do a little show and tell. Uh, okay. So why don't we start? Because we've both been away, and we've both been doing yeah. interesting things, and we have some photos. So why don't you start? I'm starting. Okay. okay do you want me with? to put the photo up, or do you want to cue me? That's when you always helpful. Photo? Well, I was, I was on the Pacific. Okay, yes, that is um, the world's biggest Tamaya model. And shortly after that photograph was taken, we blew it up with firecrackers. Um, no, <laughs> that's know. actually uh, like the Yamato Museum. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Yamato Museum in Kure. So that's uh, where the Yamato is built. And of course, biggest battleship ever built. And they have a wonderful museum there and a tremendously huge scale model of it. So that's me there. And, and I have another photo here uh, that you sent. You do. Oh, yeah. See, I, I actually had to wear my History Happy Hour hat in the jungle. Um, looking very dapper there. Yeah. That's, um, but that was actually a cool moment. That is the bunker uh, on an island called Nagibis, just off of Peleliu, and that's uh, well known for people who've read Eugene Sledge's with the Old Breed. Uh, he has kind of a transformative moment uh, at that bunker. So we went on a little hike through the jungle with machetes, etc., and and actually found the bunker, and that was. Yeah, you you look point. like you're kind of uh, uh, the the ring coach for a, a boxer, you know, about to to take on well, somebody. Yeah, it was it was it was a it was a tad on the warm side there, and um, so we all had towels to wipe away okay. the sweat from our brow. Well, and I was you? in Washington a couple of weeks ago yeah. uh, for the Ghost Army Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony, and here's here's the official wow. photo of this. We had 600 people there. Three veterans. Yeah, that was, doesn't that, that doesn't look like six hundred people. Though. No, they're there on the other side of the camera. Uh, three veterans. The ceremony was oh. presided over by the Speaker of the House. It was very moving. I, you'll notice I'm way off on the <clears throat> on the left on this shot. And uh, yeah, I, I was wondering was, about that. Yeah, why is that? And some of the well, that's just where I ended up. But some of the media photos just cut me right out. So uh, you know, it was like sort of the invisible. <laughs> place we can make rick smaller but the picture i really want to show you was the one i took in the holding room minutes before the ceremony began and just to say what's in this picture you've got the three veterans are sitting there uh, left to right john chrisman bernie bluestein and seymour nussenbaum uh and seymour and bernie are in the wheelchairs and kneeling down kneeling down and giving them their undivided attention are again left to right General Charles Brown, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Christine Wormuth, the Secretary of the Army, and uh, uh, General Randy George, uh, the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. So this 
this kind of moment to me was very, very powerful that these these high and uh, you know <clears throat> this high leadership of our US military, not just attending, not just talking to the veterans, but down on their knees to talk to them. And that was really something uh, quite spectacular. Hey, I know we're taking Navy up a lot of part. Yeah, why, yeah, where's the Air Force? Uh, why wasn't Chuck Schumer there? There are many questions that we can ask. So, another we're show. Like, our, our 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 guest Earl is sitting patiently by, so we got to get to him. But Chris, quickly before we do, who, do we have anybody here we want to say hello to in our audience? Or, Absolutely, or acknowledge yeah. their oh, yeah. presence. Well, well Sylvia Ponsleon has joined us. Uh, Stacy Roberts, uh, Liz Mumford, Doug McCord, Brian Peacock. Um, the templins. So yeah, we got a good All show. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And now we have we have killed already five minutes. So we we should get this show uh, on the road, Chris. So why don't you give me a cue? I think so. <laughs> The bar is open. And uh, the bar is open. Yes. So Again. we are going to kick off our return to live programming with a dark and powerful story that starts in rural Georgia, rural Georgia, 100 years ago. It involves murder, it involves a trial, and it involves a national controversy over the treatment of blacks by Southern planters. And this is more than 50 years after the Civil War, but it's 40 years before the civil rights uprisings of the 1960s. And our guest is Earl Swift, uh, whose book, um, a previous book was a New York Times bestseller. And he joins us to talk about his new book, which is, uh, which, which I have here at some place. I have the cover here. Yeah. It's called Hell Put to Shame, the 1921 Murder Farm Massacre and the Horror of America's Second slavery, and so Earl, welcome. Finally, I mean, finally, welcome to History Happy Hour. Thank you so much for having me, guys. We're so glad you're here. Um, your story involves a series of murders and a trial that were headline news in 1921, but are pretty much completely forgotten today. So, my first question is, how did you come across this story, and what made you want to write about? Well, I, I stumbled on it completely by accident and because it was headline news back in 1921. I was working in 2007 on another book, uh, History of the U.S. Highway System, and I was looking through, sorry about that train, looking through a... Uh, Didn't you <laughs> tell the trains to just hold off for this hour? There was a train track very close by, I okay. could feel it rumbling. Um, I was looking for a, uh, a story in the New York Times on microfilm. Uh, I was in the library at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, going through the you know, microfilm reader, looking for a brief about the 1921 Federal Aid Highway Act that I knew had appeared in the Times very deep in the bowels of the, of the newspaper sometime in March of 1921. I didn't know which day. And, uh, and so I was having to go through day by day through this month of newspapers and kept on running into these front page references to this mass murder in a, a place called Jasper County, about 40 miles southeast of Atlanta, uh, in which uh, uh, 11 black men had been, had been killed by uh, what appeared to be an unlikely murderer. And... Um, the more I read uh, of these stories, the less interested I was in the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1921. <laughs> I, I, and, and so I started pursuing uh, the narrative through these stories from day to day. And, and, um, and what emerged was uh, a tale that I had no idea. It, it opened up a, a whole new chapter of history for me that I didn't know existed. That being that in the years after re uh, Reconstruction, throughout the South, a, uh, a renewed form of slavery took hold uh, with the help often of officialdom, uh, in which uh, uh, almost always men, but men were held uh, in peonage. I saw that word a lot in these stories. I'd never seen the word before. And it, it means basically death slavery. It's where we get the word peon. And uh, 
in the case, in this particular case, the, the form it took is that a, a young black man would be arrested on a trifling charge, say vagrancy, not having, you know, been stopped by a, a cop without a nickel in his pocket. That was an offense aimed specifically at blacks. He'd be tossed in into the local jail. Uh, conviction was a foregone conclusion. And uh, he'd be he'd be facing because he couldn't pay the fine involved, which was, you know, five bucks or something. Uh, he was facing a month or more on the chain gang. And while he was uh, mulling this fate, a farmer would show up in jail and say, you know, you can come work for me. I'll pay your fine. You can you can work off your debt by coming to work on my farm. Now, most of these these prisoners were agricultural workers anyway. So this was not an unattractive offer. You know, uh, they knew the depredations of the chain gang. Those were pretty well established. Uh, so often they went home with these seeming benefactors only to find that once they got to the plantations, uh, they weren't as, uh, yeah, they, they weren't as charming as advertised. They were, uh, you know, they were held, uh, they were locked up at night. They were uh, often, uh, you know, ball and chained in the fields. Uh, they were uh, beaten for any infraction, real or imagined. Uh, and if they tried to leave, they, they were hunted down or they were killed. I was just about to let Chris ask a question there, and he has. Uh, <laughs> well, I could I could keep going for a while if you like. Well, I was going to ask. So, so we'll we'll get to peonage, and we'll talk a little bit about it, and we we hope that Chris Anderson will uh, be able to reconnect and rejoin us. We're not sure what the problem is there today, but let me ask you to kind of give us a sketch of how this story begins. Um, oh, wait a minute, he's right back. Yeah, Chris, hopefully. All right. So, Chris, I um, quickly, while you're here, <laughs> ask a question. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. what, we're going to get into a lot. Um, hopefully, I will get into it with you. Um, but one of the things I really enjoyed about the book uh, is just your descriptions of the place. Uh, and, and I want to quote you here. It says, Georgia consistently earned Johnson's attention for the simple reason that it offered a steady supply of atrocity and outrage. No state lynched more of its citizens. None was more a prisoner of its racist past. None offered so much promise bundled with disappointment, horror, and grief. So can you tell us a little bit about Georgia in 1920? What was it? I mean, what, what is the environment that this story is set in? Well, it was, it was a number of states rolled into one. Uh, you know, you had Atlanta, which was in many ways a pretty cosmopolitan place. Uh, it was uh, it was a southern city of the early 20th century, make no mistake. This was not a, a bastion of liberalism by any means. But uh, but it was a uh, it was a bustling, sophisticated metropolis. And uh, you need not go far from Atlanta to find yourself in a completely different century, really. Uh, out in the uh, in the agricultural districts of the state, it was uh, still very much a, a living in the 19th century. This was a, a mostly unelectrified, um, you know, a, a big, big area of, without running water, without, uh, without you know, basic kind of, you know, basic conveniences and uh, in which uh, agriculture was mule driven uh, and, uh, and in which uh, sharecropping was probably the, the number one uh, means of, of employment for, uh, for black people. It was about evenly divided between the races, the state was. And of course, this is a big state. This is the biggest state east of the Mississippi. So it's, you know, we're talking a uh, uh, compared to other southern states, uh, a place that uh, that exerted uh, some clout in Congress, uh, that uh, that was uh, generally regarded, I think, as uh, and, and my allusion to having so much promise as well as so much disappointment, etc., is a recognition of the fact that there were there were so many things about Georgia that seemed right on the cusp of becoming kind of 20th century, and then the state consistently disappointed its observers. And of course, the, this, this case being a, a pretty glaring example of that. 
So let's talk about how this story uh, uh, begins. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this is a case where the investigation starts before the murders and, and, and may, may in some ways have led to those murders. So give us a sense of, of how this gets started uh, and, and, and what, what rolls it off. Yeah, the, uh, the peonage was against federal law. It had been illegal uh, federally since 1867, but it was, it was not enforced by the Southern states, uh, largely. Uh, in fact, Southern agriculture relied on, on peons and, and on uh, free labor, free agricultural labor. Uh, to and I mean, just to, just to, just to, on the subject of peonage, I mean, one of the examples you gave is somebody who, who is working off their debt. They think they've done it on their way off the farm. They, they're offered a, an extra shirt or a pair of pants and they take that and then, oh, you have to pay that off too. And then it keeps being more and more ends up being there for eight years. So this isn't just work for a month or two and pay it off. This is a way to hold people for a long, long time uh, under the under the power of the law working on your farm. Oh, if you took that offer at the jailhouse and went home with a, a plantation owner, you would find often that the cost of your food, your clothing, the roof over your head, such as it was, was added to the fine that the the plantation owner had, had covered so that the longer you stayed, the deeper in debt you grew. Yeah. And it was illegal for you to leave. So the law actually backed up the plantation owner on this. But, you know, that, that was all a pretense. The plantation owner could just keep you because he wanted to keep you. He didn't really even need, you know, a financial incentive for doing so. The law was always going to take his side. And so, you know, it, uh, if he just chose not to let you leave, he chose not to let you leave. And you didn't, you didn't have much to say about it. But getting back to your original question as to how this started, a... Uh, a black man named Gus Chapman staggered one day into the offices of the Bureau of Investigation, which was the forerunner of the FBI in, at the courthouse in Atlanta, and reported that he had been held for close to a year against his will uh, down at this farm in Jasper County, and that there were a number of other men that were being held there as well, and that while he was there, he had seen one of his fellow peons murdered before his eyes, and he knew of other killings that had taken place as well. Um, so, you know, you have two federal agents, A.J. Wismer and George W. Brown, who, who meet with him, take down his story. And uh, yeah, peonage was, was, it was part of the Bureau of Investigation's bailiwick to go out and investigate these cases, but it was not a front burner kind of crime. It was difficult to prove. Uh, even if you were able to build a case, white juries almost always sided with, with white defendants in the South. Uh, and if you somehow manage to get a conviction, the, you know, the, uh, the, the sentences meted out to, uh, to white defendants were often so, so puny that it, it hardly seemed worth the effort. But a second man, a second black man walked into the office of the Bureau of Investigation as it happened and reported that he also had been kept on this Jasper County plantation and that he had also witnessed a murder while he was there. A, the murder of a different PI than the first than Gus Chapman had mentioned. And so now you had a critical mass kind of that propelled the, the agents into a visit down to Jasper County. So on February 18th, 1921, they drove to the John S. Williams plantation. And, uh, and there's John S. Williams there, 54 years old, father of 12. Uh, his oldest son had already left home was a doctor in Henry County off to the off to the west, but his three next oldest sons uh, helped him manage this 1,100 acre spread of cotton and corn. And uh, agents met with him. He said, "Look, you know, the, everybody who's here wants to be here. I run a happy, happy plantation." And uh, gives them a, a tour of the place to kind of press the, the point home. They interview several of the of the farm hands that they see in the fields. And it becomes pretty clear to them that these men are terrified that they won't say a word and not because they don't have anything to say. And it also becomes clear to them that if they're going to build a case against John S. Williams, they have to figure out a way to get these peons away from the plantation, away from him so that they can speak freely. So they leave at the end of this visit uh, frustrated, uh, but having seen enough that they, they're pretty confident that there is a case to be made. 
uh, off they go. John S. Williams in the days that follow panics. He's convinced that they're going to come back, that they will be back to take away his farm, that they will put he and his three sons in prison, that he'll lose everything that he's worked his entire life to build. He decides that the only thing to do is to destroy the evidence. And so he proceeds to, uh, to do that. Over the course of 12 days, he murders 11 men. Uh, with the help of a field boss he recruits, not a peon, but a, uh, a black man who actually lived and worked on the farm and had since childhood, a guy named Clyde Manning, who he presses into service uh, by saying, you don't help me, I'm going to kill you. So under threat of death, Clyde Manning becomes his right-hand man in, in performing these murders. So yeah, so, uh, so the visit unwittingly precipitated all that followed. Okay, so but then how does this this go then? He's he's how does this go from a, an investigation of this peonage case then to this this full bone murder investigation and trial and what well, yeah. you know what's that? Sure. Uh, well, he, Williams would have gotten away with all of this. Go these right. men would not have been messed. They were taken out of jails far from home. Now they're nowhere near Jasper County, most of them. And um, it was the style of killing that he employed really that, that led to a case being built against him. And that is because instead of merely shooting or stabbing or you know bludgeoning these men to death on his property and then burying them on his property, he, he hit on a particularly cruel and, and strange way to to do away with them, which was that he uh, bound them in wire and chain and roped them to 100 pound sacks of rocks and then threw them alive off of area bridges into local rivers. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it increased the chances that he'd be discovered. It, uh, it was, you know, I mean, it was unnecessarily complex and drawn out. And really, there seems only one explanation, and that was to amp up the cruelty and, you know, the fear these men felt before they, they finally died. And um, he would have gotten away with that, too, except that that spring, the rivers were running low and some of these bodies started coming up. So so they start coming up and... Um... We talked about Clyde Manning. Clyde Manning is is working for him, and and Clyde Manning is um, uh, on the farm there. And and the agents go back, and they they manage to get him. They take him off. They 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 bring him, and they start questioning him in a in the you know wherever in their office or in the county courthouse or wherever. And they um, and he eventually just unfolds the whole story, doesn't he? I mean, it's sort of like they don't even realize what they've got and because they've just discovered a few bodies at that point and he proceeds yeah. to say well no there's these and then there's these ones and if you go here you'll find these ones and he's he just knows the whole thing well of course he's he's perpetrated them you know he's been uh, he's been williams's uh, conspirator throughout um unwilling but conspirator nonetheless he uh you know they had spoken to him during their first visit uh and uh, he had lied to them. So they kind of identified Clyde Manning early on as someone who was particularly close to Williams and had something to hide. And so when they, you know, the, these bodies were discovered, three bodies were discovered, two of them uh, wired and chained together back to back in, um, at Allen's Bridge in the Yellow River. That's what's left of Allen's Bridge today. Um, and uh, and one was uh, was found uh, below Man's Bridge on the South River. That's Man's Bridge today. And uh, they uh, they fully expected to hear nothing more than how these three people wound up in the water. Uh, they they went into their interview with Manning with no expectation that there would be a broader story that he'd have to tell. And instead, he after some encouragement. And I mean encouragement, literally, he, he was not beaten or, or coerced uh, that we know of. He, um, he instead told them, yeah, the story of these 11 and beyond. He knew of, of killing 
to the take place years before this spree unfolded. And in fact, uh, ultimately Williams was connected, although never charged with another seven or eight uh, killings that have occurred. Ab the, above the 11? Above the 11, yeah. <sighs> And that may be the tip of, of the iceberg. This guy could have been doing it for years before, but uh, but that was the you know the institutional memory of the plantation. And remember, all these these workers are very young, so they don't have a lot of history. Any one of them, but they've been told stories. Stories been passed down among them over the years. As one peon comes and you know tells, you know, he he learns from the older peons what what the score is. Uh, you know, there's there's a good chance that if you go back to the 1890s and the you know, pre 1910, that that there are more bodies still. But I mean, I, I mean, one of the things that that kind of comes out in the in the book, uh, and it struck me as I was reading it, is Williams is almost surprised that it has even gotten this far, right? And and I, I'd had enough, you know, American history to know that very often, the word of somebody like Manning is discounted against. A man like William. So, how, how? I mean, what is it about this that actually brings this it's, it's, to go as far as it goes? How isn't it just like not brushed under? You know, because I, you, you explained that it's the manner of the killing, but you also say in the book that by this point, somewhere in the neighborhood of what thirty five hundred people had been lynched in Georgia. So, is there something just kind of particular about this case or Manning or? Well. You know, that the the particular thing is that you had federal agents involved um okay. now you know when they realized once the once these three bodies showed up underneath man's and allen's bridges uh the the local newspapers in newton and jasper counties reported it and it was picked up as a brief in the atlanta papers and that those newspapers wound up on the desk of the two federal agents who had gotten this ball rolling to begin okay. with okay. and they realized hey wait a minute this is the same neighborhood we just were visiting they take a trip down to the plantation see very few black faces around put two and two together and realize china williams is getting rid, rid of his pants and uh right. they they recognized at the same time though that uh that jasper county was uniquely uh, hamstrung and its ability to do much about it. Uh, the sheriff was John S. Williams's cousin. Uh, Williams's Williams was reputedly the richest planter in the county. That man of pretty pretty big influence in Monticello, the county seat. He uh, had business dealings with the county prosecutor. Uh, he uh, he had actually taken out a five thousand dollar loan from the man and had bought up. Uh, 282 acre piece of property from him in just a few years before. So there were all these conflicts of interest uh, in, in Jasper, uh, with Jasper pursuing it with vigor. And, uh, you know, another problem was that uh, the, the feds themselves couldn't prosecute because there's no federal statute against murder at that point. Uh, so they, they realized our best bet in seeing anything done here is probably with the governor. And they went to the governor, Hugh Dorsey, with probably little expectation that they'd have a heck of a lot of luck with him, uh, mm -hmm. mostly because he was uh, he was not known to be the most racially open-minded guy in the well, South. Well, yeah, and I, I don't want to like jump in, Rick, and steal a question, but could you, you maybe talk a little bit about Dorsey because he's got a very interesting sort of backstory before this all begins, right? Yeah, yeah the interesting Ooh, backstory yeah. and an interesting response to this. So, yeah, absolutely. Let's go there. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Hugh Dorsey had been uh, you know, the, the lead prosecutor in Fulton County uh, and earlier in his career and had prosecuted the Leo Frank case. Leo Frank was a uh, Texas-born but Yankee-raised New York uh, Jewish guy who, uh, who was the manager of a pencil factory in Atlanta. And uh, in 1913, the spring of 1913, a 13-year-old employee of the factory was found dead uh, and sexually assaulted in the basement of the factory. And Dorsey put together a case against Leo Frank and, and railroaded him into a conviction despite very strong evidence that, that uh, Frank had nothing to do with it. And then, in fact, the state's 
lead witness against him was a much more likely killer of, of Mary Fagan, the 13 year old girl. Anyway, Dorsey for good or ill uh, got a conviction and, uh, and then uh, fought all of Frank's appeals right up to the point that, uh, that the governor commuted his death sentence and, uh, and had it switched to life in prison, at which point a, a lynch mob broke into the state penal farm in Milledgeville. You don't see that happen often. Kidnapped the prisoner, drove him back to Marietta, where Mary Fagan was from, and, and lynched him. Uh, and that was in 1915. So, uh, And that's what made him governor, right? That's what made... Uh, the- made him wildly popular. He was seen as a, a defender of, of chaste white Southern womanhood, and uh, and he uh, he swept into the into the state house with uh, you know very convincingly, and uh, and then in fact uh, was unopposed for his second two year term. So, so he he comes into this with uh, a reputation of of uh, somebody who could be trusted to uphold the status quo. I think is is probably a, a reasonable way to put it. And um, instead, during the course of his his time in office, he does a slow turn. He does, and he does it out of the view of most of the public. And what prompts this 180 in his thinking, most likely, is uh, just a series of horrific racial uh, crimes that occur on his watch. But most especially a flurry of lynchings that occurred in May of 1918 down at the in the far south southern part of the state right along its Florida border and uh they're just horrific crimes that you cannot dig into these crimes these May 1918 murders without being deeply deeply moved horrified to your core that that and uh, that they give me the shivers to even think about them uh and so anyway, Dorsey surprised the agents by throwing the entire weight of the state of Georgia behind the prosecution by uh, by hiring a special prosecutor, arranging his hiring. He couldn't do it himself. And uh, by appointing his own assistant attorney general to to be part of the prosecution team, he met with uh, with the prosecutor, strategized as to how they could they could best attack the case. Of course, he was a former prosecutor himself and uh, was really part of the team was it was. Uh, a key part of the team in, in bringing China's Williams to trial. Because, you know, I mean, it, it was unusual for a white man, especially a white man of means, to be brought to trial on the word solely of black witnesses well, and, yeah. and for murdering just black women. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, 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 it's sort of two directions to go in from this. But one is, um, uh, and, and the governor, you know, does – does some more things where he seems to be be kind of coming out against against peonage against some of the racial violence and so the first question is sort of like what is this guy doing you know this hello governor you're in the south this is a this is a up, up still in 1921 a pretty racist uh, uh, environment here why are you doing this in a different direction and then the other thing so that's one question the other completely unrelated question is i I just wondered if when you look at how fast they started to they arrested and brought to trial uh john williams do you think that um like people in the area kind of knew that they kind of knew that this guy was had gone way off the edge, way beyond what you could justify, and they wanted to kind of hush things up and get him out of the way to to kind of avoid being in the spotlight. I'll take the second question first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what the sec the first one was at this point. I, I do, so I'll come back to it. But the um, no, I think he, I think he had the support of most of his neighbors. I don't think they viewed him as a societal problem. I think that they. Uh, you know, there was great surprise that he was prosecuted. And, and I say that because, it, you know, when he died years later in 1932, uh, he, uh, he got a write-up in the local paper in Monticello, in the Jasper County seat, Monticello News. 
did a story in which uh, uh, he was described as a family man, uh, a great member of the community who was uh, a pillar of his church and a contributor to all, you know, mun municipal betterment, et cetera, et cetera. Put, put a footnote in there. Also convicted murderer. Never mentioned. Tough never murderer. even a word about wow. what sent him to prison uh, or that he was in prison for that matter. It was just a little bit of an odd admission. Um, you know, he, uh, this was a case that uh, it generated so much outrage outside of Georgia that I think that the usual course of justice inside of Georgia was, was uh, frustrated. Okay, and so going back to the first part of the question, what what the hell was going on with the governor? So yeah, you, we we have some idea that there's some things that are making him change his mind, but this is this is political suicide. This is uh, you are you are not going to get any more votes in Georgia taking this position. And I know he didn't leave any diaries. He doesn't leave a letter of explanation. Here's why I did what I did. But what do you do? Do you think he just? Do you think it was simply a matter of conscience welling up and he couldn't help himself in which case why why is it only him you know why is why isn't this happening on a on a more massive scale or do you think it's a reflection of that he felt guilty about 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 frank and and uh and that conviction i mean what do you think's going on there i i wish i knew i i have some ideas i think that he was a, a very pragmatic guy at, at his core and that he recognized that with cases like this generating so much outside publicity and blackening the eye of the state uh, in the eyes of the world, uh, not just the other you know, people in the other states, that Georgia stood a very good chance of being written off as a pariah, not only uh, you know by the press and the public, but by American business. He saw uh, Georgia being uh, left undeveloped, uh, a uh, you know seen as a backwater. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and also ran an American life and, and he did not want that to happen. He, you know, he, he also, he, it's important to note that, that his break from, from the expected behavior of a white supremacist Southern governor did not end with, you know, the Jonas Williams case emboldened by this case, just a couple of weeks later, he issued a public pronouncement called a, a statement by Governor Hugh M. Dorsey as to the state of the Negro in Georgia, in which he enumerated 135 crimes against black people that had occurred on his watch. And they and, and basically stood up in front of a, a packed house at the uh, at, a, at a, a big hotel in Atlanta and and told the folks there, look, if we don't change our ways, we are going to be uh, a pariah in the eyes of the world. And rightly so. We will have earned it. And uh, and so that it was that that really did him in in terms of his political fortunes. You know, he, he that was a that was a you know the hell of the future kind of, of act on his part. And and before we make too much of the fact that he was never going to be elected again, he was pretty much out of options in terms of election. He could not run for governor a third term uh, without sitting out for four years and then coming back. Uh, he had just lost the year before a run for the U.S. Senate and. That was, you know, he had, he had lost decisively. Um, so he, you know, he was his electoral future was pretty cloudy to begin with, uh, and yeah, you know, that he may have thought that at that juncture he uh, he was in a unique position. He had very little to lose politically. Uh, you know, it was disastrous for him in pretty much every way, socially, uh, financially. You know, it, it did him in. But uh, but it did not stand in the way of him getting elected again. So, Earl, you know, he, he, and kind of on this thought, I mean, he does, and I, I find it a very interesting thing that he he mentions. You talk about in the book. That he says, "Look, you know, if we want people to invest in Georgia and do all these great things in Georgia, we have to. We can't do this." So, you know, I was that's an argument against this whole system that I hadn't seen made before, which I, I found very interesting. But how? How does this case and this story become national news? Right? When it, when does it go from being this odd thing that's happening in, in Georgia? And now you know you're talking about the New York Times and 
how does this become a global or a national story and what impact does that have on on, on the case well i think it it becomes it, it is amplified quite a bit by the leadership of the NAACP. Right. Now, the uh, uh, just a couple of months before the agents made that first visit to the John S. Williams plantation, uh, the NAACP had acquired its first black leader, uh, its mm. first black executive secretary, James Weldon Johnson. Yeah. It's often forgotten that the NAACP was actually created in the main by white Northeastern do-gooders. Yeah. Uh, and it took until 1920 for them to, to get their first executive secretary who was black. And James Weldon Johnson is one of the most remarkable figures in American history. Uh, he and his Lieutenant Walt, um, Walter White, another amazing figure, um, really uh, took this story and wouldn't let it die. They just they were really good with publicity. They understood how to get stories in the newspaper. They understood what newspapers would respond to in terms of the story. They were big on sending telegrams to public officials, denouncing such, you know, one thing or another, and, and making sure that the contents of those telegrams made their way into print. Uh, and that's, that's what they did here. They recognized right away that here was a case that put a human face on peonage, not only for the victims, but also for the perpetrators. Because peonage was usually, you know, it was this shadowy thing. If if people were aware of it at all, and I think most Americans had no idea what was going on, um, you know, it was an abstraction. You didn't see actual people involved in it. And here mm -hmm. you had actual people. And uh, so along with the, the gruesome methodology that Williams used in, in doing away with these guys, it was the, uh, it was the fact that the federal agents and Hugh Dorsey had allies in James Weldon Johnson and Walter F. White, I think, that really propelled this into the, you know, the upper echelons of the public right. consciousness. Right, right. So um, there's national attention. The story is in the New York Times. Uh, the NAACP is on it and making a big deal out of it. The governor of Georgia is sort of taking a stand on racism and on peonage. And so this leads to a new era in race relations in America. And okay, well, it doesn't. So why doesn't it? Why you, 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 the, the, you stumbled on this story and you said, oh, here's this thing that nobody knows about. And then you saw all of this stuff that happened and you must have said, why didn't this kind of lead to a, a, a change of some kind? You know, why does it kind of fold back in and submerge into the depths of history again? I don't, I don't think it did. I, I don't, I think it did have an effect. It, it, I think it, it threw a hard light on, on the practice, practice that again, most Americans, most Georgians, I think had no idea that was, was taking place. And, uh, it became a lot harder to pull off, especially the model that Williams used in which you bailed prisoners out of local jails. The, the folks who did that were forced to pretty much forced to stop that immediately, you know, in the immediate years after after this this happened. It just it was too hot. And so, you, you know, you can't say that it, it was without without impact. It, it had an impact. And, it, and not only that, but it just it brought the word into into the lexicon, and um, and once it was there, and there was an awareness uh, that this practice existed, people people knew to look for it. The it, cases were prosecuted by the feds uh, with with renewed interest. Uh, a lot of people went to jail. A lot of law people in law enforcement went to jail, and uh, and you saw courts suddenly willing to to make convictions. Uh, it did linger. It, uh, especially in the more subtle forms, you know, when you, when you, peonage was not, uh, the, the style in, that Williams used bailing people out. That was not the most, uh, prevalent form of peonage. The most prevalent form was baked into sharecropping. And that was, you know, that involved tens of thousands of victims, uh, a huge population. The, uh, you know, sharecropping, if it, if it worked the way it was supposed to, it meant that you as a, 
a sharecropper would work for a landlord. You, you live on the landlord's property. He'd give you a chunk of land and you'd raise crops on that land and your rent payment was a percentage of the crops that you raised, usually half. Uh, either you'd give him the crops and he'd go to market and sell them or you try to sell them yourself and give them half the money. Usually it was the former. He would take the crops to market. Now, the problem with that is that you had to live all year before you got to harvest time and got your payment for the crops you had raised. So the landlord would would front you the food, the seed, the, you know, all the equipment you needed, uh, and then you'd pay him back out of your earnings at the end of the year. The problem was that the landlord uh, all too often was not on the up and up. He jacked up the prices that he charged you for the provisions that you needed to live on over the course of the year before harvest. And then he trimmed the value of the crops that you raised. He might be getting 28, you know, $28 a bushel or something for your crops while he's paying you 10. Um, and you have, you have no recourse if that's the case as a black man. If you question his accounting, you question his word, well, that'll get you killed. Uh, and, you know, you can't leave because at the end of the year, thanks to these accounting practices, you owe him money instead of, you know, you haven't, you haven't actually earned anything. You, you actually wind up in the red. And so it rolls over for a year. And then you repeat the process and you wind up deeper in debt at the end of the second year. So that's the form. That, that was the most widespread form of PH, was this much more subtle uh, thing. And that took quite a while to, to finally put to put to rest and really the mechanization of agriculture during and after immediately after World War II had a had a pretty big role in, in bringing that to an end. But why do you think it is? I mean, I've kind of come into Rick's defense here a bit, which I very I very seldom do. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm waking up. But, uh, uh, but this this case is so horrific. Okay. And, and it, it, it at the time it got so much information press and attention and but none of my books I ever heard about civil rights in college or grad school mention this. Um, we all know about Emmett Till, as we should, or the Freedom Riders, or all these sorts of... This story, why isn't this kind of moment in time, the PNH system and, and this case in particular, why is it such a surprise to us now? I mean, you know, that you were shocked by this. I think it is the... Uh... The fact that it occurred when it did. I mean, look at Tulsa. You know, right. look at the race riot in June of nineteen twenty-one in Tulsa, which is is really what knocked this out of the headlines. Yeah. Um, you know, that was that was unknown to most Americans until a couple of years ago when we got to the anniversary. Right. Uh, look at uh, look at the Red Summer of nineteen nineteen. Any one of those individual white on black race riots that killed hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Right. Uh, you know how much public awareness is there that this, that that happened that that black soldiers were attacked for for being in uniform after they had been overseas fighting for the cause it, right. you know it uh this whole period is pretty much a blank i think yeah because we we had a we had had a, a historian on many years ago and she talked about this kind of this <laughs> period before the civil rights movement before we think the civil rights movement started um, and again, I, I'm just curious as to your thoughts as to why this is just a part of that story that just seems to. Yeah, well, you know, I, I wish I had a, an explanation as to why there was this huge gap in my knowledge. I mm -hmm. thought I knew 20th century American history pretty well before mm -hmm. I stumbled on those those stories in the Times. And the fact is, there were decades of American history that were just smudges, you know, they're very yeah. big. And um, it's, uh, I, I had never heard of James Weldon Johnson before I started working on this book. And I hang my head in shame about this because you look into his story and you see that the civil rights movement was not a product of the fifties and sixties. It was right. well underway in the late teens, right. uh, thanks to people like Johnson and W.E.B. Du Bois. And um, mm. so it's, you know, I, uh, I think that we, as a country, uh, chose to have very short memories back then about yeah. 
things that we found troubling and um, or things perhaps that we didn't find troubling. You know, right. I don't know how much outrage right. there was about Tulsa in among the, the American. Uh, I'll tell you what, what. So I so um, I, I'm going to I'm going to try to answer your question, Chris, because, mm -hmm. you know, I've been thinking about this and I think a lot of this has to do with um, the, that, that the civil rights movement really flowers and comes to bloom in the 50s and 60s has to do with television. I think that somehow people could ignore print articles, they could ignore unsettling photos, but they couldn't ignore f footage that's being broadcast into their living room on CBS News, on NBC News, showing riots, showing the police treatment, showing this kind of stuff. And I think I think that it really, I, I think it, it suddenly, I think that's what it took for, for people who might have, you know, responded, you know, previously had they really been, had they, had they really been appealed to, but, but for people to say, well, wait a minute, we, wait a minute, this isn't right. Maybe we should do something about this. Maybe these people who are protesting against it need our support. I mean, I think television is a big part to do with that. I, I'd buy that. And also, you got to remember, this is occurring at the same time that Confederate statues are being erected in many southern cities. This is occurring uh, even as uh, there's a, 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 re, a renewal, a, a second run for uh, Birth of a Nation, which had come out six, seven years before, but, but now enjoyed a second run through American theaters. Uh, you know, so... <laughs> It, it, it the story reached an audience that was not necessarily sympathetic to the victims. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the other, you know, I think that mass media certainly is a huge piece of it. And there's no substitute for moving pictures from the Edmund Pettus Bridge, for instance. I mean, right. uh, but the... Uh, or, or Sheriff Clark, you know. Uh, yeah, or Bull Connor or whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you don't get those pictures out of your head. Um, but at the same time, you know, there, it's even if there had been uh, a, a better way to more quickly reach a greater piece of the population with a more visceral sort of representation of the news, um, I don't know that the American public at that point would have responded in the way that we'd like to think they would have. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my grandfather was 16 years old when this happened. And one thing this story has prompted me to to mull is whether if I went back through time and ran into him in 1921, mm -hmm. whether I'd like the guy I was running into. Uh, All right. All right. Well, you know, one question, I, another question I had, I know we're getting close to the end, but I, I was fascinated by, because again, just you, you raised so many really compelling points, but you were talking about some of the characters that you'd written about so well throughout the book and at the end and what happened to them and of course when people buy your book they can delve into this a bit more but um you were talking about the process of researching um some of the african americans in the story and how it was very difficult to do uh, and part of the difficulty lay in their response to this whole system how they they didn't leave traces um and so maybe you know you could tell us a little bit about your process and some of the difficulties you encountered and um, you know, kind of about that idea. Well, one of the, you know, the great things about uh, writing this book now was that uh, I was able to access online records that would have been unavailable to me just a few years ago. And, right. uh, and so I had, uh, you know, I was able to, to, to use the census with, you know, and, and to search through the census uh, in, in a way that just trimmed months of library research out of the process. Uh, right. And, you know, when it, when it came time to try to track down some of the descendants of the victims of the, the peons and the other black laborers on the, on the Williams farm, you know, one of the, one of the issues I ran into was that the census itself had very little information about them. Uh, it often got their names wrong. Uh, they sometimes appeared twice in the same sentence. Uh, census, and you hear that that can't happen. But in 1920, it did happen. I, I found several cases of it. Um, you know, the uh, 
there just wasn't a lot to go on with the with the first generation people involved in this thing, let alone people, you know, four generations down the pike. And, mm -hmm. uh, but eventually I was able to to use the census primarily in city directories and kind of these old school, you know, shoe leather reporting tools to, to follow people over time as they moved around, uh, you know, the, the black residents of the plantation scattered right after the, the trials. And uh, most of them went to Atlanta, a few of them went to other cities, Charlotte, uh, uh, a few of them uh, moved north. There were some that settled in Ohio. And uh, and one of the things that, that further stymied uh, uh, or further complicated the process was that these victims did not talk about what they'd been through. Now, when I, when I researched the when I tried to reach the descendants of John S. Williams, I found that many of his descendants grew up with no idea that this had happened. You know, they also scattered. They wound up in Texas and Florida, most of them. And the descendants, they didn't know that Grandpa and, you know, that Uncle Leroy was indicted for murder. They didn't know that the great grandpa John S. Williams was a was a serial killer, basically. They, you know, they had no clue that that had happened. Uh, and, but what was surprising to me was that the black victims kind of responded in the same way. They just kept their mouth shut about what, what they had been through. What did the, the, we are near the end, but there's not another show that starts after this, so we can go a, a moment or too long. What was the reaction? Uh, you're going to, you're talking to William's family members who maybe don't know much about this or have just uh, heard about it. Uh, what was their reaction to like, oh my God, this guy is going to come and write a book about my relative who I had no idea was a murderer. Now it turns out, you know, probably was. Well, they knew that he was a murderer by the time I came to them. They, they had, I think most of them had found out uh, in the nineties and early aughts that this had, this had transpired. And uh, uh, they didn't know much about what had happened. They had, they had the basic outlines of, of what had occurred and, there, there might have been a tiny bit of trepidation about having this, this unknown person writing about their family history. But in the main, I got nothing but cooperation from John S. Williams's uh, descendants, most of whom were as hungry for answers and for understanding as I was. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were wonderful. And they're reading the book right now. So I guess it'll, we'll find out soon <laughs> enough, you know, whether their trust was, they feel their trust was well placed. But, um, and, you know, in the case of, uh, I, I ran down one grandson of uh, one of the field bosses on the, on the farm, a uh, black worker named Claude Freeman. His grandson, Kenneth Freeman, lives in Akron, Ohio. And uh, he had found out about it probably in the 90s or early aughts as well from, uh, from relatives uh, of his mother, of his grandmother, uh, whom he had never met. She died of pellagra in 1929. Um, and he was, you know, he knew what he had heard from these, his grandmother's relatives, but, but knew, had heard nothing really to fill in the gaps of his knowledge since. So, uh, I got pretty much the same reaction from him. He was, he was hungry for, for understanding. And, uh, he's also reading the book now. So we'll see what he thinks. Well, we, Earl Swift, we want to thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour and mentioned that your book is called Hell Put to Shame. Uh, and you do talk in there a little bit about sources and research, and which is quite fascinating in this story. Yeah. Hell Put to Shame, the 1921 Murder Farm Massacre and the Horror of America's Second Slavery. So lots of details in there that we didn't get into uh, on the trial. Yeah, so you need to buy a copy and look through and find out about this uh, story that we should all know about. So thank you very much for bringing it to our attention. Uh, Rick, Chris, thank you so much. For thank you. Me. Thanks so much. Uh, okay. Well, Chris, uh, we're, we're live again next week. I like, go. Oh, it's like a twofer. I know it's going to be a threefer because we have three weeks before we before we go off into vacation mode again. Um, next week, uh, British military historian Saul David returns to History Happy Hour with a new book about the British Airborne in World War II. It's called Sky Warriors, 
and it tells the full story of the British Airborne from its formation in 1940 to Operation Varsity in 1945, which was the largest airborne landing in history. And we know we have some fans here of the 101st Airborne yeah. and the 82nd Airborne. And I know uh, Saul says that the uh, British Airborne were some of the finest troops who served in World War II, so uh, well, we'll we'll grill we'll grill Saul. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll take him on, and we'll, yes. we'll force him to back up that uh, outrageous uh, that, claim. <laughs> that point of view. Um, you know, tomorrow is the um, is the two hundred and forty ninth anniversary of the Battle of Lexington, uh, and it? Uh, it is it. Well, tomorrow is the the reenactment. Uh, and when we get to the 250th uh, anniversary, you and I are going to be leading a tour there. I expect that tour to be finally, finally have all the itinerary and stuff posted on the Stephen Ambrose Tours website in the next day or two. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. We'll talk about Saul David next week. And Oh, uh, and I, I also want to slip in that not only is it the anniversary, but it's also tax day. Hmm. Make yes, it is, and you know, and you know, interesting, who, interesting conclusions can be drawn from that. And you know, who I'm going to see tomorrow. Who are you going to see tomorrow? Hampton Sides. Oh. He's appearing at a bookstore, so I'm going to go up. Marilyn and I are going to go up and be like fawn, a fanboy. Fawn like him. A yes, we are fanboys and girls. Guys, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, shout at us on Twitter, listen to our podcast, back us on Patreon, and browse historyhappyhour.com. Right. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.